Thanks for the invitation. Um, okay, so, so this is a talk about algorithmic questions. And generally speaking, when you're doing geometric or combinatorial group theory, there are um, uh, three, three basic algorithmic questions to look at. There's the word problem. Um, do, do, I need to enter, do I need to define those terms? Or no? The word problem is familiar. There's, there's the word problem, there's the conjugacy problem, and then, for instance, the, isom uh, the isomorphism problem as well, and then you, can, uh, then you can ask any number of other algorithmic questions. So um, the context here is that um, I'll be talking about an algorithmic result about free group automorphisms and cyclic extensions of free groups, and that one will, will turn out to be relevant to the, um, to the conjugacy problem in, in a certain interesting class of groups. Okay, so let's start by introducing the players. We've got um, a finitely generated free group, and we pick some automorphism of this free group. And now, given, given this kind of information, uh, we want to be able to determine whether one element of the free group is contained in the, in the orbit of another uh, element um, of the free group. In other words, say if we have two elements u and v in our free group, then we want to, then we want to be able to determine algorithmically whether there exists some exponent k such that uh, phi, phi to the k applied to u equals v. And um, this might look slightly funny. I'm, I'm using algebraic sort of notation here with the automorphism following the element to, to which it is applied, um, just because the, the notation will work out more, um, more conveniently this way. OK. So, and the basic idea behind this algorithm is really quite simple. So I want to take my element u, and then I want to um, apply that I want to apply phi, and then I want to apply phi again and again and again, until something happens. And there are basically three possibilities. The first possibility is that at some point we encounter the element v that we're looking for. Right? In that case, we know that u and v are in the same automorphic orbit. Uh, the next possibility is that, um, well, after a while we go. We come full circle and uh, we, we return to u. And if we haven't encountered v in the meantime, then we know that we're never going to encounter v. Okay. So, so those are the two easy cases. And now here's the hard case. Um, so um, of, of course, if you're only looking for the first two cases and u is not in the orbit of, or v is not in the orbit of u, then you can iterate all you like and you'll, you'll never reach that termination criterion. So, so somehow you have to have a way of telling when you've iterated enough, when, when they so basically want to say, all right, if, if I haven't reached V by now, then I'm never going to reach V at all. And, um, and essentially the idea here is to, to recognize a point of no return. Essentially, you, you detect a certain growth, so the, the images of you get longer and longer, generically. And at some point, you just want to look at, uh, at, at the image and detect a certain kind of growth that is not going to cancel. Um, and, and say, if, if you have an amount of growth that's not going to cancel and that's longer than your target v, then you know that you're never going to get back to v, at which point you've, you've, you've reached or you've recognized a point of no return. And how long uh, Ah, that's exactly what the talk is about. So, um, so OK. And uh, so in the third case, of course, there's still the possibility that, uh, that we might reach v with a negative exponent. Um, so if we so if we get a negative answer after after ending up in case three, then we have to reverse the roles of u and v and and run the same algorithm again. Okay, so so what does that have to do with the three basic or with, with the basic uh, dis uh, group theoretic decision problems that I mentioned? Well, if you uh, look at if you look at a free bicyclic group, so in other words, if you define a group that looks like this. So you take your, the generators of your free group, and then um, you, you add one additional generator, the so-called stable letter, and you stipulate that t inverse xi t be equal to xi applied to phi for i equal to 1 up to n. Is this a familiar object? Cyclic extensions of free groups? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so, so, you, so you suppose you want to solve the conjugacy problem in um, uh, in in this case, then well, 
once you start doing a few computations and you um, and you think about it for a little bit, you realize that this is essentially uh, this is essentially two problems. So depending on the exponent sum of your stable letters t in the word that, that you're looking at. So I suppose you have two words in your free bicyclic group. And first of all, you can just look at the um, uh, you, you can look at the exponent sum of your stable letters t on one side. You can look at the exponent sum of uh, of the stable letter in the other word. If they are different, you already know they are not going to be conjugate. So, so you only so so, you, so the only co the conjugacy problem really only is a problem if the sum of the exponents in one word for t is the sum of the exponents of t in the other word. Okay. Um, and now in that case, well, you've got two cases. Either the, the, the sum of the exponents of t is zero or the sum of the exponents of t in there is, is non-zero. And, um, well, if the sum of the exponents of t is zero, then essentially, um, then well, you can spell out the equation of the equations, and, and it turns out that uh, the question of whether two, two elements like this are conjugate is exactly the question of whether you can find, uh, of, of whether one is contained in the automorphic orbit of the other one. Um, so. So in other words, uh, this is one. This is one half of the of the conjugacy problem in free bicyclic groups, right there. And the other half, where the exponent sum is non-zero, well, essentially Armando Martino uh, thought of a of a really slick uh, algebraic manipulation that that reduces the the case of exponent of non-zero exponent sum to the case of zero exponent sum. So in, so in other words, it, ultimately everything everything in the um, in the, con the conjugacy problem reduces to to this particular problem here. So that's um, so so their argument is really really nice. I, I like it a lot. Okay. Um, all right. So 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 far we've only talked about group theory. So now at this point I'd like to uh, translate the. Um, I'd like to translate the question into topological terms, and uh, the first step here is to to move away from proper automorphisms and to get into the realm of uh, outer automorphisms. So, so generally speaking, when when you're doing geometric or topological work with free group automorphisms, outer automorphisms are much much more convenient to work with than. Uh, so auto-automorphisms are much, much more uh, con convenient to work with than, um, than actual automorphisms. Um, maybe just for context. Uh, so the question that we're, that we're, that we're looking at is that we, given, given an automorphism and two elements of a, free, uh, other, of a finitely generated free group, can we decide whether um, it's a, some power of the automorphism applied to one element will equal the other element? And that roughly turns out to be the so that's that's one half of, of the of the conjugacy problem in uh, in in three bicycle groups. Uh, so okay, so that's what we're working on right now. Good, thank you. All right, uh, the okay. Um, so for 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 reasons of convenience and for technical reasons, it's it's a good idea to to rephrase this problem in terms of uh, outer automorphisms and. Well, outer automorphisms act on conjugacy, conjugacy classes of elements, and now, um, so, so I'd like to get to a point where I can uh, say recognize orbits under proper automorphisms as long as and as soon as I can recognize orbits under outer automorphisms. And it turns out that this, this is quite simple. You you just um, use a trick that's so silly that I'm almost embarrassed to write it down. Instead of taking your uh, instead. <laughs> Instead of taking your, your original free group F, you take your free group F and you adjoin one more generator, let's call it A here, and then you extend your automorphism by, by just keeping it the same on the original group F and by fixing the letter A. So mm -hmm. what effect does that have? Well, if you take some element W of F, then you can look at A times W in the, um, in sort of, uh, in, in, the, um, in the larger group, and now A times W will be cyclically reduced. So, so in particular, that means that if you um, if you can if you can if you can recognize um, orbits of the uh, conjugacy class of A W in the um, 
um, under, under auto-automorphisms in the bigger free group, then you can recognize orbits of W under a real automorphism in the smaller group. So, um, so those, in other words, those two problems are really the same thing, and, and working with auto-automorphisms is much, much more convenient. And why? Why is this more convenient? Well, um, we want to represent an auto-automorphism, or oh, well, an automorphism or an auto-automorphism of a free group as a homotopy equivalence of a finite graph. And now, um, the, the technical difference between automorphisms and auto-automorphisms here is that when you're looking at automorphisms, you, you want to keep track of a base point and you want to implement, you, you want to look at base loops. When, if you, uh, if you make the transition to auto-automorphisms, that basically means that you can forget about the base point. And that's a huge, huge technical, technical advantage. Mm. So, so we, want to, we want to represent our automorphisms, uh, our auto-automorphisms as, uh, as homotopy equivalences of finite graphs, and we, we don't have to worry about base points. OK, so, so now um, the conjugacy classes in the free group will, will correspond to circuits in our finite graph. And um, well, we've we've got a notion we've got a notion of length in our graph. Right? In the simplest case, we might just um, assign a length of one to every edge in the graph, and then use that to to measure the lengths of, of circuits. We can, we can also basically assign any any other, any any other metric as long as or well, whatever. Yeah. Any other metric we do. I don't think we have any additional conditions. So uh, the point is, the metric metric doesn't matter too much. Um, and, uh, but as soon as we have one, we can measure the length of loops. And now, um, now essentially here, um, I've got a more technical statement of, a statement of what it means to, uh, to have reached a point of no return. Uh, in, in this case, uh, we want to find a loop of a certain length. And, and we, want to, we want to find a criterion that tells us that, uh, that all future images of this loop will be at least this length. All right, and here's one more uh, simplification. So instead of um, instead of looking at the at the map itself, at the automorphism itself, we can replace it by some power of the automorphism that we're looking at. So it's essentially, the, the reasoning is that um, well, if you say if you uh, if you have your map evaluated at certain at certain powers, um, or if you're looking at certain powers of your automorphism, then whatever difference between this point and the points in between you see will be will be bounded by some factor that you can compute a priori. You can, do, for instance, you can define the notion of a set of a size of an automorphism, meaning the length of the uh, longest image of a of a generator, and then. Well, say from from here to here, um, the um, the growth that you occur from here to here, or rather, the, or for that matter, the shrinkage that you occur from that you incur from here to here, is bounded by the size of the autom automorphism to the mth power. So, in particular, now that means that say if if you phrase your the length in your point of no return criterion to just be, to, to to be scaled up. By, by some appropriate power of the size of your automorphism, then that means that you can detect points of no returns, the points of no return by um, just evaluating your automorphism at, at a rather sparse collection of points. Why is that an advantage? Well, uh, generally speaking, when, when you're looking at free group automorphisms, you have a mixture of uh, finite order phenom phenomena and large scale phenomena. So you might you might have some part of the automorphism that just commutes a bunch of elements around, and you might have some other part of an automorphism that just stretches things and gives you gives you ex for instance exponential growth in the long term. And generally speaking, um, when you when you when you're doing say dynamic arguments on on, on free group automorphisms, um, finite order finite order, order phenomena are, are trouble. They they are hard to deal with technically. Uh, and what you really want to do is see large, large scale growth phenomena. And, and, now, and at this point, this observation is, gives you a real advantage because 
this essentially says that you can raise your automorphism to a suitable power that will, that will just make all the, all, the, all the strange periodic things that might otherwise mess up your argument go away. And what's, what's left is the, the raw long-term growth that, that, we are, that we're interested in here in particular. Okay, so, so that's roughly the topological setup. And now, once, uh, once we have represented our automorphism as a homotopy equivalence of a finite graph, we, um, we realize that, well, there's more than one way to do this. In particular, there, there are good ways of doing this and bad ways of doing this. And what, what we are after here is one, particular, one particularly good way of representing an automorphism, and that in term, that's in terms of a so-called relative train track map. So what does that mean? Uh, that means, first of all, that we have a filtration of our graph. So, we've got, so we think of the graph as a, um, as a union of larger and larger subsets. And if we, if we look at the restriction of our map f to each, to each filtration element, we see, we see that it restricts to a homotopy equivalence of this particular filtration element. And, uh, then if, if you look at the differences between two, two successive strata, that's something that, that I'll call, a, uh, between two successive filtration elements, that's something that I'll call a stratum. Okay, so, let's see. At this point, things get a little bit technical. Um, probably, probably a good idea to, uh, to explain this in terms of examples. Um, let's, let's look at, say, some, um, um, some silly automorphism. Say, let's look at uh, an automorphism with three generators A, B, and C, and then, um, and then we define a, actually, Then we define an automorphism that um, sends A to A, B to B times A, and then it might send C to um, um, I don't know D and D to uh, C D. Is that is that what I want? Right? We'll see. I'm, I may I may have to correct this in a in a minute. In any case, so if you if you just do um, if you just do a quick reality check here, this is definitely an automorphism of um, of our free. And now, um, so 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 there are a couple of observations here. Uh, first of all, so if you look at um, So whenever you apply phi to a, you just get a back. So we've got something that's constant here. If you let, if you look at um, the image of b under phi to the k, you get b times a to the k. So well, you get something constant here. You get linear growth here. <coughs> is, k, is k positive always? Pardon? If you're assuming k to be a positive power. Um, b it doesn't matter, right? Ultimately, it really doesn't matter. You mm -hmm. might be negative too. You get the, you get the same you get the same linear growth going backwards. Right. Um, okay. So, and now let's let's look at uh, let's look at images of C here. So C goes to D goes to C D goes to uh, uh, D C D goes to what uh, C D D C D and so on, and um, let's see. You've, you've got a you've got a so-called transition matrix here. To it. So essentially, um, well, you you write down a you, you write down a matrix that measures um, that that measures how many times the image of each edge here crosses the. Um, uh, Crosses the other edges, and 
I just want to I just want to look at this for our two letters C and D here. So C goes to zero times D and then to one uh, to zero times C and then one times D and this one goes to uh, one and one. Right? Okay. And now let's see. I guess if if you compute the eigenvalues here, you get some you get some eigenvalue that's larger than one. So, so in particular, this means that what you're seeing right here is exponential growth. Okay. All right. So, and I, I should point out the, the way to that the way to define the transition matrix uh, is not to care about exponents. So, for instance, if I had c times d inverse here, I would still get the same transition matrix. The reasoning being that we want to use this transition matrix as, say, a rough estimate of, um, of the growth of our automorphism. And then, say, when you're just looking in terms of the con contribution to the length of an edge, then you don't care whether you cross the edge this way or that way. It's always going to add one to the length of your loop. So, um, so in the transition matrix, we just pick up all the letters that we see in here, and we, um, and we we, we add them up without without paying any attention to to the sign of the exponent. All right. So um, can the exponent of the transition matrix ever be? Z I'm sorry. Can the uh, determinant of the transition matrix ever be zero? Uh, oh, absolutely. Um, for, an, for, a, for, a, for an automorphism. Yes, uh, oh, because the trend, the trend, it's not the it's not the matrix of the abelianization. So, um, for instance, it's okay. Don't worry. I, uh, I I believe you. You don't have to give me an example. So yeah, for for example, yeah okay. Now let's forget an example. I'm yes, probably, it's not I'm probably get myself into trouble yeah, anyway. Right. But, um, <laughs> all right. Uh, right. So so let's see. What am I saying here? Um, so so if you if you decom if you decompose this um, um, if you decompose this thing into strata, then you would have some initial stratum G one that contains A. And then you would have a second stratum that contains B and A, and then a third stratum that contains uh, A, B, C, and D. And then your uh, not stratum filtration element. And then your then your strata will be for A, uh, B, and. If you check the conditions here, well, if we look at the restriction here, we uh, we get a nice restriction of our map. Um, and now here, in the interesting part is that here we get a stratum consisting of two elements. And um, so, so we write down the transition matrix. We we see uh, that that it has that it has the largest eigenvalue greater than one, and um, and we're in business as far as this is concerned. Uh, now, so that was that was the first part here. The second part is actually crucial. So for every edge in a stratum like this one, we we, we want that um, uh, we want that say when we take the image of the edge under some power of the automorphism, and then we tighten. We tighten this image to give us uh, to give us a reduced word. You have class. I see. No problem. Bye. Um, so, so when we when when we tighten this image to give us a to give us a reduced word, uh, then then we don't want to cancel any um, then we don't want to cancel any any edges in this particular strand. Okay. So, what's the point of that? Well, the point of that is that, well, essentially, if, if you look at if you look at the transition matrix here, then you can look at powers of it, and you'll see that the entries in powers um, that the entries in powers of the transition matrix correspond to occurrences of our letters in the corresponding images of our edge before cancellation. 
Mm. Now, if we have this additional condition that no edges in, in the stratum that we're looking at cancel, then that means that that we can that we can actually um, then that means that we can actually compute uh, the number of edges in here that occur in some in some future image of our edge just by computing entries in, in our matrix here. Right. Th that's that's a very crucial point here. If, if we if we ha if we have this condition that um, that no edges in in, in the in the stratum that we're interested in will will cancel, then that means that we can measure growth in terms of entries of the trend of powers of the transition matrix, and that's a that's a real simplification. Okay, um, right, and then uh, then we've got the then we've got the other case where a stratum could just consist of one edge, and um, and in, in this case we want to in this case we want to map the the edge to the to the edge times some loop in a in a lower filtration element. So for instance, the example to think of would be this line right here, where you've got well one edge in the stratum and this edge maps to this edge times something in a lower stratum or in a lower filtration element. Or another possibility is that well this loop U R might be trivial, like here, where a just maps to a times nothing, in which case u r would just be the trivial path. Okay, uh, so fine. So what is what is this good for? Well, if or what if we have all those conditions, then we're looking at a so-called relative tri trend map. And now. Uh, uh, Warren Dix and Enrique Ventura did us the great favor of working through all the technical details of the construction of relative train track maps, and they came up with a solid algorithm that um, that computes relative train track maps for some power of the uh, of the automorphism. So you saw on a previous slide uh, that um, that it's for that it's good enough if we solve our orbit detection problem for powers of the automorphism that we're interested in. Well, and that's most convenient because when we say when we're computing good representatives of our automorphism, we may have to pass to some power of it in, once again in order to make strange finite order phenomena go away. Um, okay, good. So we've got so we've got an idea as to how to um, how to represent our automorphisms in a way that will let us detect growth in a fairly straightforward fashion, and we've got an algorithm that actually gives us such a representation. This, uh, you're considering growth rate of um, Well, it, I mean, there are various ways of defining the notion of growth rate. So, mm -hmm. so what, I'm, um, what, I, what I'll be looking at here is actually not one growth rate, but a collection of growth rates. So you, so you decompose your automorphism into various strata, and Whenever I, I, I encounter an, an exponential stratum, I look at the transition matrix. Mm. That one will have the largest real eigenvalue, and then that's that's the growth rate for that part of the automorphism, as far as I'm concerned. So, but, but there are plenty plenty of other ways of of def, of, defining. of defining the notion of the growth rate of an automorphism. So there, there's so I guess there's no such a thing as saying that the the you know the growth rate of the automorphism is exponential. It would be a little dangerous to say. Um, there are, first of all, there are special cases. So, for example, um, there's uh, there's this notion of so-called irreducible automorphisms, where well, all this just collapses, and you just have one big stratum. You can can't re you can't reduce it any further, and that's a special case. In a, in a sense, that's uh, probably one of the most interesting cases. So, if you if you're familiar with um, if you're familiar with the surface homeomorphisms, for example, mm. uh, the the irreducible case actually I should be more more careful. The irreducible case with irreducible powers corresponds to the pseudo Anosov case in, in in surface homeomorphisms. So, mm. so so there are lots and lots of interesting and, and important examples where no re where no reduction like this is possible. In which case you get you get one you get one transition matrix. You mm. get one. Um, um, uh, you get one you, you get one growth rate for the transition matrix, 
and that actually turns out to be the um, what's it called the asymptotic growth rate of your automorphism. Oh, okay. Thank you. But there are other ways, of, and so but this this kind of growth rate will be irrational in general. There are other ways of defining growth that, that usually yeah. that, that always gives you a rational number. For instance, it mm -hmm. depends on what you want to measure. This, the first one you have a phi, uh, phi of k to the eighth a or a to the k is this. This one? So the first one? Yeah. 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 So k. Okay. Just a to the k is written a. No, no. <laughs> phi, phi doesn't do anything to so a. a. Okay. I see. So it's with, don't do anything k times. What do you get? Yes. Yeah. What, what you started with. Um, would, I mean, would it be different if you just considered the I had the um, same question. <laughs> you mean, you, you're asking um, to what extent this generalizes? Or, 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 or maybe so just an endomorphism. to the endomorphism of so the group. Um, can well, you actually bring this? Can, can I defer that question? Oh, yes, to the end. Because, yes, yes. because we get to a point where, um, okay, yeah. where, yes, where, where, where I can address that more naturally. Yes. Okay. Um, all right, which is actually right here. Uh, <laughs> very we didn't have to wait too much. <laughs> very desperately curious um, about that. So, so one, one of the very fundamental results in the theory of free group automorphisms is <coughs> Thurston's bound Thurston's bounded cancellation norm. And um, and what, what what this says is that you if you if you have two paths that that have no cancellation between them, and then you you apply an automorphism or well homotopy equivalence to them, then the result the length of the resulting path. Uh, will be the length of the image of one path, or will be bounded, will be bounded below by the length of the image of one path plus the length of the image of the other path, plus uh, minus some some cancellation between the two images. But but the point here is that this cancellation will be bounded independently of the two paths. The, the maximum amount of of cancellation that you'll encounter is 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 only determined by the automorphism. So, so the picture here is that, say, you have, um, I guess I probably want to keep this, but I'll uh, get rid of this. If you have one path and another path, say alpha and beta, and then you apply the map f to it, then, well, you get alpha f. And then you might, might have some overlap here, and you get um, a beta f. Okay. And well, if the amount of cancellation that you see between the two will be bounded by this bounded cancellation constant. Okay. And this is a this is a very crucial tool. So if you look at pretty much any kind of geometric or dynamic argument involving free group automorphisms, chances are there's a bounded cancellation argument lurking in the background. And in order to make this, in order to generalize this, well, you, you, you need your endomorphisms to be injected. So, um, so, so, we, so we definitely, um, we definitely need, in, uh, we definitely need in injective, uh, injectivity in order to generalize this. That, that's, uh, that's the crucial restriction here. Surjectivity is not such a big deal and um, and a lot of the arguments will go, will go through for, uh, for injective endomorphisms. But um, the general feeling of people working in this area seems to be that, yes, we believe it, it can be done, but nobody, nobody's really had the nerve to, to dig through all the technical arguments and make sure that, <laughs> that really, if, in case, case 3.5.7 of the construction of, um, of the non-exponential part of the relative train track model still works. If you <laughs> not subjectivity. Somebody probably ought to do it, but um, hasn't <laughs> happened so far. So, all right. Okay. So we've got um, we've got the bounded cancellation lemma, and and we get some almost immediate benefit from from that. Uh, okay. So we need, or what, almost immediate, we need, to, we, need, we need one more technical yeah. term here. Um, so if you, so if you're in the situation where you're looking at a at an exponential stratum, 
and you've got some path in this exponential stratum, then we say that this is a legal path if, um, if, no, if no edges in this stratum ever cancel if we, if we tighten images under some power of this automorphism to, well, reduce paths. Okay? So if, if you remember the, um, the definition of relative train track maps here, essentially what this part here says is that edges in exponential strata are legal paths. Okay. And now, now you can go ahead and and generalize uh, well and, and generalize this notion. So, so if if you have a path that if you have a path where no edges in, in the stratum that we're currently considering will cancel, then um, then you're looking at a legal path. And well, that's uh, that's an extremely useful notion here because say when when you have some path in um, uh, in a stratum like this. You can think of it as a composition of uh, of legal paths. So you've got something something legal here. So if, as you as you iterate in here, no edges in the stratum will ever cancel. As you iterate in here, no edges in the stratum will ever cancel, and so on. And we've seen before that uh, that the number of those edges in here will grow exponentially as you iterate. Okay. Uh, this is exactly what I just said. So, the, so the length of those of those of those subpaths will grow exponentially. And um, now, if if these things are really long, then what's going to happen? Well, you see exponential growth here. You may see a little bit of bounded cancellation. You see exponential growth here, maybe a little bit of bounded cancellation, and exponential growth again. And the point here is that exponential growth beats bounded cancellation. So, okay, so we see something that grows exponentially. All right, maybe, maybe, maybe something, something gets canceled at the edges, but, but we're not really impressed because, we're, because whatever cancels it is bounded, and, and we're growing exponentially here. So, so ultimately, exponential growth prevails. And you can make you can make that precise. You can write on a criterion that says how long this path has to be for, for exponential growth to prevail. Um, okay. And now here, here we have our here we have our first criterion for a point of no return. Um, say suppose we have something of exponential growth. Um, and then say we iterate, 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 and at some point we see a Long legal subpath. We we see a legal subpath that's so long that uh, first of all, um, whatever cancels at the edges is barely enough to is is not is not enough to 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 stop the growth of it. And and if this if this path is also longer than the target loop v that we're looking for, then we know that we've reached a, then we know that we've reached a point of no return because we know that this legal subpath is never ever going to go away. And if it's already like, already longer than what we're looking for, then, then we know that what we're looking for will not be in the future. And essentially, um, this may sound like a special case, but it's actually a very general case. When when you have this kind of um, exponent when you when you have this kind of exponential growth and you iterate, 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 then ultimately what has to happen is that either either you see Exponential. Well, either you see growth prevail in this fashion, or you see something go around in circles. You see some kind of periodicity, and per per the periodicity is a rather rare case that's easily disposed of. So, so in a sense, this, as far as as far as strata of exponential growth are concerned, this is really the generic case, and and we're done with it. Okay. So, in, in as far as our orbit detection problem is concerned. Uh, um, non-exponential strata, strata like these, are much harder to deal with. And that's really where the main work in, uh, in this paper lies. Uh, so, so remember the, the, way, the way we defined this was that we take the image of a non-exponent. So a non-exponential strata just contains one edge ER, and now we want, we, we've rigged things in such a way that if we apply our homotopy equivalence to 
uh, to our edge and to our unique edge in this non-exponential stratum, then the result will be the, uh, the, the same edge times some loop in a lower stratum. And so now we can play some games with this. We, uh, uh, we, can, we can take a non-exponential edge and we can replace it by a slightly different edge. So, so the picture here is um, this. Some graph, and now if now we can take this edge, for example, and and we can slide it. So, so uh, the idea being that we can remove this edge right here, and instead we, uh, for instance, might slide it along this path to turn up to give us this new edge. If we do this, we, we, if we do this, we get a graph that's homotopy equivalent to um, uh, that's homotopy equivalent to the graph that we started with, and now we only have to figure out how to modify our map in such a way that it still induces the same automorphism. Okay. And well, so, so so what I indicated here would be this path row. So if I slide. Um, so if I slide this original edge along this path row, I end up with this edge, and um, and now let's let's see where where this modified edge goes. So, so we can express this as the original edge er followed by row would be this one. And after some computation, we see that this essentially uh, that this gives us a new um, non-exponential stratum and the new loop is essentially a twisted conjugate of the original loop. And that's trouble. That's trouble because um, sliding operations, or, or rather say the possibility of sliding, might give, uh, might give us some kind of phantom growth. It might give us some kind of growth that say, if, if we're just naively taking our, taking our relative train track map and we're iterating and we're seeing things grow, um, then that doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that this corresponds to, to growth in, in the group itself. Why is that? Um, well, you might take a constant edge like this, and you might slide it along some path in such a way that rho bar followed by rho f doesn't, it doesn't cancel to give you a trivial path. It might, in fact, it might in fact give you some path that grows, might even give you some path that grows exponentially, right? So, so in other words, um, say when you're, looking, when you're looking at a map like this and you're seeing a non-exponential stratum that, uh, that grows somehow, you have to be suspicious. It might be proper growth, or, or it might just be the result of an unfortunate slide that gives you some phantom growth. And that's, that's really the, the one crucial uh, complication of this entire argument. So all, all the other ideas are pretty obvious. Ta take your points of no return, ex exploit bounded cancellation, exploit exponential growth, no problem at all. You, you, you do that in five minutes if you're familiar with the, with the tools of the trade. Capturing, catching this kind of phantom growth and dealing with it was the hard part. Okay. And, well, there's a solution, sort of. Vesvina, Fain, and Tandell have introduced the notion of improved relative train track maps. Um, that, that don't have this kind of problem. So if, if you see something that, that something non-exponential that grows in an improved relative train track map, then you know that it that it then you know that it grows for sure. The problem is that the construction is not algorithmic. And it's very much non-algorithmic. First of all, they go to the universal cover and they find some interesting points in the universal cover. <laughs> and then and then they look at, at at orbits of those interesting points in the exponential covering and 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 using some compactness arguments somewhere, they know that uh, they know that. Uh, so just just through some comp compactness arguments, some magical point in your graph emerges, and then you know that if you slide your <laughs> if you slide your edge to that point, you get rid of whatever bogus growth you might have. 
not not algorithmic at all. And the, and the, and the, and the, the sort of the problem would be the compact, the use of compactness. I mean, uh, that, that's kind of the non-algorithmic yeah, yeah, problem. Yeah, right. I mean, general mm -hmm. universal coverings are trouble in general too. I mean, in this case, it's not they're not so bad because they're always trees, but so you can so you can construct say sufficiently large subsets to work in. But yeah, um, ultimately. Getting uh, getting to this limit point for a compactness argument. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that there's the point. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Good luck <laughs> finding. All right. So 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 essentially we need to we need to fix that. So the idea so the idea is to come up um, to come up with with an, with um, well um, I'm, I, I'd like to say an improved version of relative train track maps, but since since that word is already taken. <laughs> I need some other words, so let's call it. Let's call it efficient. Really? <laughs> let's let's call it. Let's call it efficient. Um, and what what are the conditions here? Well, if um, the main condition is that if uh, the main condition here is that if this new QR is non-trivial, then we cannot express it as then there's no path such that we can write it as row bar row f. In, in other words. If we if we see a non-trivial loop, then this loop is really non-trivial. It's not it's not the result of of an unfortunate slide of a trivial loop. Mm. Okay. So here, if you if you go back, right? If, if you slide a trivial loop, you get some you get something new called like row bar row f. If we see something non-trivial, that's that's not the case. So, and that's really the most important part. Um, well, this part is kind of well. It looks technical, but it's really not that bad. If you say if if you have an edge that maps to e times u, then well, if you if you apply f again, you get u f here. If you apply it again, you get u f squared, and so on. Okay, so. So all, all, I'm, all, I'm re all I'm requiring here is that when we compute this thing, then there's no cancellation here, and there's no cancellation here, and no cancellation here, and so on. Looks technical, but, but this is actually fairly, fairly easy. Essentially, essentially what you do is you, you, look at, you look at this loop u, and you see how it grows, and say, say you might see some exponential, uh, so you, you might see some cancellation along the way, but just with a little bit of technical work, you can determine some point that'll, that'll never be part of some cancellation somewhere. That's, that's not hard at all. And once you've got this point, well, if, if initially your edge E attached here, then instead you just do a slide and you replace it by some suitable edge ER, and, and you get this condition for free. So what, we, so what we have to work on is the first condition, and that's the hard part. Right, um, this is essentially the picture I just drew here. So if you take if you take repeated images of uh, of some non-exponential edge under the automorphism, you get you get this picture right here, and if you you want to think of this as a ray from from some point in your uh, in the tree to to infinity. By the way, how much time do I have? I'm almost done, but uh, yeah, I mean, ten minutes. I'll, I'll be done in I'll be done in four minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's see. Okay, so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to talk fast. Um, uh, so so now I, one one thing I really like about this argument is that it turns out that the the computation of um, uh, the compu the computation of efficient strata. And the and and the solution of this orbit detection problem are really related problems. Uh, so once 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 you've got efficient once you've got efficient strata, you can you can you can solve the orbit detection problem in um, well in in, the, in that filtration element and below. And once um, one, once you're able to once you're once you're able to solve the uh, the, the the orbit detection problem in in this filtration element. You can make the next stratum efficient, and so so you go okay. So you so you, you solve your you solve your your orbit detection problem. You 
make a stratum efficient, solve the, solve the orbit detection problem, make the next stratum efficient, and so on. So, 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 the, um, so, so those two arguments dovetail very nicely. Um, okay. Now, um, oh, this, oh, this is actually what I, what I said here, so I was getting ahead of myself. Um, and yeah, so, so the, the truly crucial part here is to determine um, is to determine whether whether we can have whether something non-trivial, some some non-trivial loop u like this was actually the result of an unfortunate slide. Okay. Um, and that's actually something that I'd like to sweep under the rug because it's a lengthy and, and technical argument. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in the paper. Yeah. <laughs> and all right. So, so we've already seen points of no return uh, in the context of uh, exponentially growing strata. So now, so assuming that all those, on, on that this efficiency business is done and that we can compute efficient strata and so on, uh, let's let's see how that solves, um, how that gives us um, points, uh, how this gives us points of no return in the non-exponential case. Well, the first thing to observe is that if you have a path um, in, in a uh, non-exponential stratum, then you can cut it into pieces, that, into simple pieces that do not interfere with each other. You, can, you, you have pieces of the form ER times gamma, where gamma is a path in a, in a lower part of your graph, or in a, in a lower filtration element, or you have ER, gamma, ER bar, once again, where gamma is something in a lower filtration element. Why is that? Well, copies of E, E, R will never cancel with each other. They are sort of in R. They, they just send out some. Um, they just send out something in a lower stratum. But if they didn't cancel with each other initially, they are not going to cancel with each other in the image. So you can, so you can decompose those and look at them individually. And then there's one kind of annoying special case where you're looking at trivial or periodic loops, and. Um, well, essentially, you write down a bunch of linear inequalities and you just see that sooner, sooner or later, uh, essentially what, what happens is that, that you have a composition of various absolute value functions. So you see, um, you see a picture like this, but, but since ultimately you've got a composition of absolute value functions, it's sooner or later it's going to have to grow that way, it's going to have to grow this way. And that, and that kind of growth won't cancel. So, so that's um, that's an easier that's the easier part. And now here, finally, once uh, once we've got our uh, efficient train track maps, um, we see we apply this lemma that shows us that if we have a path like this, it will converge to the ray that we saw before. We've uh, we've carefully rigged the ray in such a way that there's um, that there's no cancellation in it. And in particular, that means that once we see an initial, once we see a prefix of the ray that's as long as we need it to be, plus possibly some some fudge factor to account for bond for bonded cancellation. So once we see a prefix that's that, that's greater that's longer than say the length that we're looking for, plus plus the bonded cancellation constant, then we know that we can iterate all we like, and and this part is not going to go away. So that gives us a point of no return. Can your work be generalized to classes of groups that are very close to, to free groups from having generated free groups? Um, For example, let's say. To, what, what kind of to classes of groups that are very close to, uh, to free groups. I mean, can this argument. Well, I mean, ultimately, all, all this kind of train track business is, is really uh, motivated by, by the surface group case. Okay. So, so I see. So, so the surface group case, so that means that, you know, that if you have certain nice properties on, on one. On a one-related group, you might be able to actually get this sort of thing going. Yes. Potentially, yes, and and uh, there are some papers essentially where uh, say where you end up with a with a graph. So essentially, you have something like a free group with a bunch of surface groups or other one-related groups hanging off of it, and a certain a certain part of, of this train track machinery can be um, 
can be um, recovered in this case. But um, again, I think it's, it, it's fully or essentially free groups, for example, are a good candidate for. Um, well, no one seems reasonable. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just. Yeah. Well, ultimately, um, maybe. But you, but you have all, and then you have all those abelian pieces that that don't really re require much different treatment. Oh, I see. Okay. So you want a non non abelian full Well, ultimately, the the, the, the one the, the core idea that that drives all these arguments is that um, when you're looking at a train track map. Um, the uh, the length of the of the path that you see is the, the is, is the length of the word in in the corresponding group. Right. And as mm -hmm. soon as you have relations, that yeah. that doesn't work anymore. Sure. So so that sh so so technically. You yes, but you, you said that it was this was generalized from uh, surface groups. Surface groups have relations. You know. uh, they have one relation. Yes. Right. And so right. So I mean, and, there are a lot of fully residually free groups that have only one relation. For example. You know, and surface groups. You can deal with that relation or some sort right. of control right. over. So you it. you probably want to just mm -hmm. you know clamp on the relations. Of course, I mean, of course, in the surface group you can uh, you can usually use some tricks to make the relation go away. You say, that, right. okay, I've mm -hmm. got my homeomorphism and I know it's got to have a fixed point somewhere, so I just patch a hole. I just make a hole in, in <laughs> my surface, and and that and that gives us a punctured surface whose fundamental group is conveniently free. <laughs> and, um, so. So in a sense, there are technical tricks that, that really get, get rid of the, of the relation as far as the uh, as far uh, as far as the group theoretic work is concerned. And then the machinery becomes like this. Mm -hmm. It's the same. Interesting. Ultimately, this notion of train tracks goes back to, to Thurston's notion of train tracks for surface homeomorphism. Uh -huh. right. so. I see. Okay, so let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure entirely. <laughs>